This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news, compiled in the early hours of the morning on Wednesday the 10th of January. I'm James Copnell with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service news today. Coming up, Steve Bannon, the former chief strategist of President Trump, has stepped down as executive chairman of Breitbart News. In Ukraine, the murder of a young lawyer is shining a light on what many regard as the country's corrupt judiciary. Also in the podcast, a cardboard cutout replacement, one leader's unusual method of avoiding reporters' questions. Whoever wants to take a picture or ask questions about politics or conflicts, ask this guy. Bye-bye. Why time's not up in France and the perils of being in space for one Japanese astronaut who's grown nine centimetres. Uh, you want to make sure that, that he hasn't grown too much for his seat, otherwise he could hurt or, or break his neck or his back when he lands. But first, the former White House advisor Steve Bannon has resigned from Breitbart News, the influential conservative website which he has led since 2012. Last week, Mr Bannon was quoted as making a series of critical remarks about Mr Trump and his team in a new book about the administration, Fire and Fury. He then apologised. So, was this resignation inevitable? I asked our Washington correspondent, Anthony Zerka. I think the writing was on the wall. Uh, Mr. Bannon had criticized not only the, the president, but also his family in very direct terms, calling uh, uh, Jared Kushner, and, uh, uh, which is Donald Trump's son-in-law, and Donald Trump Jr. possibly treasonous for their meetings with uh, Russians uh, during the campaign in 2016, calling Ivanka Trump dumb as a brick. I mean, you do not insult the president's family and expect to, to get off easy. And the Trump administration essentially drew, drew, drew a line, said it was either them or Bannon. Uh, Bannon's funders, including the Mercer families, cut off support and began negotiations on pushing him out of Breitbart. And here we are just a few days later, and that is a reality. It's a pretty astonishing fall from this rising star, this new voice. Where does it leave, do you think, the movement, as it were, the alt-right and uh, that right side of, extreme right side of uh, U.S. politics? I think it's a damaging blow to this uh, economic nationalism, this uh, populism that uh, Bannon had endorsed. Here we just watched Donald Trump today sit down with a bipartisan group of uh, legislators and talk about comprehensive immigration reform. That's the sort of thing that Bannon railed against, this idea of what he characterized as amnesty for uh, undocumented immigrants into this country. Donald Trump signed a tax bill that has a massive corporate tax cut, which is, again, another thing that's not really economic populism. Donald Trump even talked about, or his administration talked about, sending the president to Davos to meet with uh, economic globalists. Uh, this is not the revolution that Steve Bannon imagined. And I know it's happened very recently, but what sort of reaction has there been, or are you expecting in, in Washington? Well, I think right now you're seeing uh, a relief on the part of establishment Republicans from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on down. Bannon had talked about funding uh, insurgent candidates to upset all of these Republican office holders who he, he thought were not sufficiently embracing his populist revolution. Uh, and now it looks like he's not going to have the money that's been cut off and he won't have the media megaphone empire, which he can use to direct attacks on to people like Mitch McConnell. Uh, and uh, and the like who were running for re-election were definitely worried about their right flank. They were worried about uh, an insurgent mood in, in uh, the U.S. that was still very prevalent, but now right. it may not have that kind of support. Anthony Zerka. The conflict in Syria has drawn in countries from around the world, creating a war, or more accurately several wars, by proxy. Now the Syrian military has accused Israel of carrying out airstrikes on a military base northeast of the capital, Damascus. Israel has not confirmed this. But the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, did say his country was prepared to act to stop weapons leaving Syria and coming under the control of Hezbollah. We have um, a long-standing policy to uh, prevent the transfer of game-changing weapons to Hezbollah from the Syrian territory. This policy has not changed. We back it up as necessary with action. Mr Netanyahu also spoke out strongly against Iran, insisting he wouldn't allow the country to establish a military base in Syria. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, is in the Syrian capital, Damascus. She told me more about the airstrikes. 
The Syrian military in a statement said that there were three consecutive attacks in the early hours of Tuesday morning with Israel deploying both its warplanes as well as surface-to-surface missiles and they seem to have been striking an area just northeast of Damascus. Syrian military just called it a military target but other reports speak of loud explosions, a series of loud explosions in an area where there are said to be arms depots used not just by the Syrian military but by one of its most important allies, and that is Lebanon's Hezbollah forces. Israelis are saying that they want to stop weapons getting to Hezbollah. Is there any independent evidence that that's actually happening on a large scale? Well, Israel never confirms any of its strikes against neighboring Syria, and it's now known to be carrying out these strikes every few months. Today, in Jerusalem, at a NATO meeting, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, referred to what he called a long-standing policy to stop the transfer of weapons from Syrian territory across the border to its arch enemy, Hezbollah. And it is widely known that this complicated relationship involving not just Syria and Hezbollah, but also Iran. Now, Hezbollah and Iran are playing an absolutely crucial role in bolstering President Assad's forces against the Syrian opposition. They also are trying to protect their crucial strategic relationship. And what Iran, it's often said, is trying to protect is this land corridor from Damascus to Beirut so that it keeps both its strength in this region but also keeps its allies strong. What sort of international reaction will there be, do you think, to these latest developments? I don't think we can expect very much. This is very much part of this tension in the region. But this latest attack comes at a time just days after an important cabinet meeting in Israel where they focused on the, what they fear will be growing strength of Iran and Hezbollah right along Israel's northern border. As the Syrian military continues to gain ground, it moves closer to their common border as it takes back territory from the rebels. That means Hezbollah can go closer to the border and so can Iran. And there you have a very combustible mix. Everyone understands the risks of accidentally tumbling into an escalation. Lise, you've travelled to Syria, to Damascus, many times over the last few years. Is there any sense that we're any closer to an end to this civil war? It's certainly in a new phase. All the major cities are now in the hands of President Assad's forces, thanks in large part to the strength of his allies, both Russia and an array of Iran-backed militias. But the war is not over. We hear warplanes in the skies every night. There's a suburb of Damascus, eastern Ghouta, where there's still a major confrontation going on. And there is also a growing confrontation in the last province in rebel hands, and that is Idlib, where there has been sustained bombing by Syrian and Russian warplanes. So not over yet, but the momentum is clearly with President Assad's forces. But the end of this war, and certainly an end to the tensions between so many different powers, is far from over. The funeral has taken place in Ukraine of a young lawyer whose murder is rapidly becoming a test case for efforts to reform what many regard as the country's corrupt and biased judiciary. Irina Nozdrovska's body was discovered five days after she appeared in court to testify against the nephew of a local judge who knocked down and killed her sister while drink driving. From Kiev, here's our correspondent Jonah Fisher. This is Irina Nozdrovska two years ago, in full flow. She was then leading a very public campaign to try and make sure the drink driver who killed her sister was prosecuted. It was an uphill struggle, in part because the man responsible was politically connected, the nephew of a local judge. But against the odds, Miss Nozdrovska succeeded, and two weeks ago, the driver had a jail sentence of seven years confirmed. But the process made Ms. Nozdrovska powerful enemies, and a few days after the final court hearing, her dead body was discovered, dumped in a river near her home. Today, her family and friends came together in shock and grief. They murdered you for telling the truth, said her father as he wept over the coffin. They removed you because you were standing in their way. Under intense pressure, Ukraine's police service has arrested someone. But trust in the judicial system is so low that many people doubt whether justice will be done. Ukraine has a poor track record of solving politically connected murders. The killing of Irina Nostrovska is now an important test case, 
of what progress, if any, has been made. Jonah Fisher. Taking a pill every day, or even several times a day, is quite a challenge for many people with chronic illnesses. Now researchers in the US have developed a new technology which releases drugs into the stomach over a period of several days. So far it's been tested on pigs using HIV medication. Michelle Roberts from our science unit told me more. This device, it looks like a little normal capsule that you'd swallow. A um, standard pill a capsule. A standard pill, but when it hits the stomach, the coating goes, and inside there's a special folded structure that's like a spiky star. It's got six arms, and on these arms it opens up once it, it's released from its packaging. It can open up a bit like a flower's petals, and the drugs then on the arms can gradually be released so that you've got this constant level of drug over the seven days. And why is that such a benefit? Well, some people are fine taking a pill every day, but other people might, may forget to take it. Some, some people don't like the idea of having to take something every single day of their life. So it, it's trying to make things easier for people. Also, it might not just be for HIV. That it's, the whole concept is being able to put different types of drugs on this device that will open up in the stomach and stay in the stomach um, for the amount of time that you want it before it then starts biodegrading and, and being removed. So and a spiky star opening up inside, I mean, that sounds quite painful. Presumably, uh, they're going to have to be some difficult testing phases to go through before this goes on to humans? So, so far they've done it in pigs. Um, they've done it for this, these HIV drugs. They've also done it for a malaria drug um, for, which lasted for a couple of weeks. They want to move on to doing it in humans and there's a company that's going to be looking at doing it this year with, with the device. It sounds slightly strange but the, the device itself is quite small. It's four centimetres across when it opens up and it's got six little spiky arms on it. Obviously there are other treatments out there that can give you longer release but those are injectable generally so if somebody didn't want to use a, a needle then swallowing a pill once a week might be more preferable. Because there is a real problem isn't there of people starting a course say of HIV treatment and not finishing it, missing pills out. It, it can be difficult I mean I spoke with the Terence Higgins Trust um, and they said that you know a pill a day can present practical barriers for some people living with HIV. Certainly other conditions, if, if we could treat things like dementia or possibly some neuropsychiatric problems, you know, so schizophrenia and things like that, where compliance might be more of an issue, then that could be really useful. Michelle Roberts. And the testing of that technology will continue, and researchers say trials with humans with HIV could begin within two years. In France, it looks as if the hashtag Time's Up may not be getting the same amount of support it got at the Golden Globes. Female stars at those awards took the opportunity to speak out about sexual harassment in the film industry. But across the Atlantic, some women think the rhetoric has gone too far. The French actress Catherine Deneuve is among 100 women to have signed an open letter defending the right of men to make sexual advances. Hugh Schofield reports from Paris. In this open letter, published in Le Monde, the women say there's a new Puritanism afoot in the world. While it was legitimate and necessary to speak out against the abuse of power by some men, now they say the campaign of denunciation has got out of control. Men are being punished whose only wrong has been to touch a knee, try to steal a kiss, or send a sexual message to a woman who does not share his feeling of attraction. According to the writers, the end result of all this will be very much against the interests of women. In, because it's creating a public mood in which women are seen as powerless, as perpetual victims. We do not recognise ourselves, the women conclude, in this feminism whose face is a hatred of men and sexuality. We believe our freedom to say no goes hand in hand with the freedom of men to make unwelcome advances. Clumsy flirtation is not the same as sexual aggression. Hugh Schofield, you're listening to Global News. The most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in The World This Week and the programme is also available to download from our website www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. An Iranian Member of Parliament has said that thousands more people were arrested during recent anti-government protests than has officially been stated. Our Middle East analyst, Sebastian Usher, has been telling me more. 
I mean, we don't have official confirmation. The official figures are around 1,000 people arrested in the days of protest, which also the officials say are now over. They said the weekend it was essentially came to an end. The authorities brought it to an end. Um, but we've heard from uh, an Iranian MP, a reformist MP, who's given a much bigger figure than that, saying around 3,400 people. There's also concern over deaths that we've been hearing about in custody. Again, it's unclear. Um, one death was confirmed yesterday by the judicial authorities in uh, Evin prison in Tehran, another one today in the city of Arak, both places where there were protests. But in each case, the authorities did two things. One, they didn't say that these were protesters, and two, they said they committed suicide. Now, the family of one of the protesters says, Definitely, he was a protester. He was not a drug dealer, as the authorities tried to claim. And they said that what they've seen of um, their relative's body doesn't look in any way like suicide. And at this very, very sensitive time, a video has come out that might well be embarrassing for the country's supreme leader. Yes, it certainly caused a lot of debate since it emerged a day or so ago. It's a video going back almost 30 years, which was when Ayatollah Ali Khamenei was essentially appointed as the supreme leader by the Council of Guardians. And in it, understandably, he says in a very modest way that he is not up to the job. Understandable that he was showing excess modesty. But it is a weak point. It's known he wasn't qualified to the full extent that someone who has... Terms. In religious terms. In religious terms, he was not of the elite that would be able to assume that position. So that's always been a bit of a problem for him. I think it's no accident that it's emerged now. It emerged from um, a TV station run in Turkey by Iranian exiles. Um, and I think it was meant to embarrass him because he's more vulnerable now. These protests have ever started about the economy quickly switched to political attacks and he was very much uh, in the front line of that. Posters of him were torn down, uh, slogans were shouted against him. Sebastian Usher. Most politicians try to avoid awkward questions from reporters, but it looks as if Thailand's Prime Minister, Prayut Janocha, has found a unique tactic. He took a cardboard copy of himself to a news conference dedicated to Children's Day and put it behind the microphone. Whoever wants to take a picture or ask questions about politics or conflicts, ask this guy. Bye bye. <laughs> Laughter there, but the online news editor for Workpoint News in Bangkok, Nobbajur Gutanon, told the BBC's Nuna McGovern that the Prime Minister had played this joke before. I think this is the third time already. And the, the cardboard were there because next week will be Children's Day in Thailand. And we, we weren't surprised with that because this wasn't the first time. This wasn't the first time. Has he used the cardboard cutout in the same way? Yes, exactly the same way. And, and for similar situation, you know, when he couldn't answer some question or he chose not to answer it, he set up this standy cardboard and, you know, just ignore all that answers. And is he, was he worried about being asked questions about other things apart from Children's Day, do you think? Yes, yes, there are some questions that he probably get annoyed by. Question about corruption and about his deputy and some government officers who doesn't, you know, really bring a good, uh, positive energy to the government house. And the journalists focus on that. So you want to dodge those questions by bringing the cardboard. <laughs> I don't think he, he seemed to draw more attention perhaps to his press conference with the cardboard cutout. But is he known for having a strange sense of humour? Yes, he is known for having this kind of, some will call it a sense of humour, you know, but some will just say this is very childish, you know, this is a very, very childish way to dodge those important questions. But how it works in Thailand is that journalists who work in the government house go to the place every day, just like the Westminster journalists. So they kind of get used to this humor, or get used to his sense of everything personally. So, yeah, it's, it's, it wasn't a surprise, like I said. I'll tell you who did react was Human Rights Watch. They said this act added to a long list of his bizarre and bullying reactions to reporters. They called it a contempt of media criticism. Have the press been speaking about it or other reporters? To be honest, not really. Human rights isn't always isn't the top priority in Thailand when it comes to trouble, you know, when it comes to problems that journalists are asking prime minister or government officers. But it doesn't mean that 
its popularity is in positive range right now though. The journalists kind of used to it and some press see it as a good photo op, you know, a good chance to have 17 cardboard. There were 17 cardboard out there to arrange in any formation, you know, if one of the press set it up as like a football position, you know, 11 on the field and six on the on the bench. So this is this is what happened because in the end we know that he wouldn't answer the question that we asked anyway, and this is how it ended up. Online editor for Workpoint News, Nobajuk Utanon, speaking to Nuna McGovern. Rising to your feet and joining in a brisk sing along of the national anthem stirs up patriotic feelings like little else. That was the thinking, at any rate, of the Indian authorities when they recently ordered cinemas to play the anthem before every screening. It was a decision that sparked widespread debate, and now the Supreme Court has scrapped the order. Our South Asia regional editor, Jill McGivering, reports. The cinema is full, the film's about to start, but first, all stand. Until today, cinemas across India had to play the national anthem before every film, and the audience had to stand to show respect. The order was only introduced 14 months ago, and the idea of a compulsory show of respect led to fierce argument about freedoms, to the arrests of some who refused to comply, and even assaults on those who wouldn't get to their feet. The court ruling was in response to a petition by an ex-soldier. At the time, the government applauded it, but now it's changed its mind, and made the suggestion this week that the court reverse the order. Newspapers were quick to call it a government U-turn. On social media and newspaper sites, some were dismayed by the move, but many described it as a victory for common sense. Many said they were all in favour of respecting the national anthem, but didn't want it to be mandatory. Thank you. Cinema halls may choose to play, and that is the way it should be. Thank you, Supreme Court. Nationalism and patriotism need not be forced on anyone. Hats off. We're all patriotic. We don't need any compulsion. Some called on the government to focus on more important issues like unemployment and the economy, even accused it of using the anthem issue to divert attention. And there was room, too, for humour. Play the national anthem at the end of the movie. Then everybody will stand. Joe McGivering reporting. The Japanese astronaut Norishigi Kanai has been on board the International Space Station for the past three weeks, and today he sent out this eye-catching tweet. Good morning, everybody. I have a major announcement today. We had our bodies measured after reaching space, and wow, 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 I had actually grown by as much as nine centimetres. Mr. Kano went on to say that he was a bit worried that he wouldn't fit in the seat allocated for him in the Soyuz spacecraft, which will take him back to Earth. Chris Hadfield is a Canadian former astronaut. He spoke to the BBC's Tim Franks. It's more than average for sure. And of course, it's not really growth. You're not growing again like when you were a teenager. What's actually happening is each one of the bones in your body is getting slightly further apart because there's no gravity to push you down anymore. And so especially up your backbone, each of the little vertebra gets a little further apart. And if you're a tall astronaut like Norshiga, then it gets magnified because you're, you're uh, longer to begin with. But nine centimeters, that, that's probably more th than reality. It's really hard to measure somebody when there's no gravity. You can't just stand up against a wall. It's kind of like measuring yourself floating in the surf. So right. it'll be interesting to see when they remeasure exactly how much taller he's gotten. Okay. It's one of those problems about being in space that I haven't really conjured with. Yes, that it's, it's yeah. difficult to uh, get a tape measure up against somebody. Uh, did it happen to you when you were aboard the space station? It does. All astronauts, their, their backbone stretches. You get a little taller when you're weightless. Um, and in my case, since I'm about six feet tall, I got about uh, maybe four centimeters taller, or, or, you know, about, about that much, a little, little bit bigger. And what's intriguing is then you have to anticipate that. Um, what uh, Nora Shugia was talking about is the seat that will support and protect his body when he comes uh, crashing back to Earth on the Soyuz. It's a crash seat. It's designed to take up the force of the landing. And so you don't want it to fit uh, improperly. And the, the Russian designers, the sculptors who build those seats, actually anticipate us being a little bit taller 
in his case, uh, you want to make sure that, that he hasn't grown too much for his seat. Otherwise, he could hurt or, or break his neck or his back when he lands. Oh, it's that serious. I mean, it's not just this is a first world problem about trying to fit in an economy class seat. It's, this is something potentially rather more serious. Now, imagine if, if a race car driver in, in a Formula One car was suddenly six inches taller and they went through a crash. They're... Um, they're, they're their uh, seat wouldn't protect them. They, they'd have a lar- lot larger chance of injury. And, and in this case, it's it's a planned crash when we come home in a Soyuz. So, uh, so yeah, definitely he wants to get the seat modified. We've actually had astronauts who put muscle mass on up there, and they've gone in and carved the extra foam out of the seats to make sure that they uh, they have as much protection as possible when we hit the Earth again. Right. I mean, that sounds like quite a primitive response to this challenge. Could they do something similar with somebody who had grown more than the... or not grown, you've corrected me on that, stretched more than they anticipated? Um, yeah, the the weight, it, it, it's an adjustable seat to some degree. Part of it is form-fitted. But yeah, it's just foam, so you can modify it to match. The other thing is if you're going to do a spacewalk, that suit that we go outside in is very carefully sized. And they also anticipate that you'll grow four or five centimeters. Um, but if, if Norris Shiga were to go out on a spacewalk, he may have to modify that suit, put some extra rings in it, loosen up some of the adjustments so that it wouldn't be crushing him the whole time he was outside walking in space. And how quickly on return do you uh, get back to normal size? Well, you know, I actually, when I landed the first time on my first space flight, uh, as I started getting under gravity and I stood up again, I swore I could actually feel, like, like when you slip something in your back, I could feel my back compressing back down again, almost a, a palpable uh, a give to it. And, and it happens quite rapidly. It, r- gravity is relentless. It's, it's, a, it's a punishing oppressor and, and it grinds our bones as close to them as our, as our body will allow. So no matter how much taller you get in space, it's not going to last when you get home. That's the former Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield speaking to the BBC's Tim Franks. And that's all from us for now. But an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm James Copnell. Until next time, goodbye.